two five, and then I lost the majority of my vision over sort of a twelve month period. So growing up, in a, I grew up in Narrabeen in uh, on the northern beaches of Sydney, and um, everyone, you know, it was pro surfers everywhere and um, rock stars and all sorts of stuff going on, and it was just uh, yeah, being having being a kid with a disability was was tricky. So I, I basically spent the first twenty years of my life trying to prove to the world I didn't have a disability. Because I just, I didn't, you know, I didn't own that in myself. And I think that set me back a long way in my life because I didn't, didn't take that, didn't take that on board and realize that that's actually, you know, there's, lots, there's some things I did really well, but there's other parts of my life that I've, I've got a disability. I'm blind. So I might as well just t- take, accept that and get on with it. So it took me a long time to accept that. Um, but yeah, the, diff- the different drivers have been there in my life and I've had different focuses, but there's always been um, a drive to succeed. So when were you diagnosed, Matt? Uh, the year or, or the age when I was five. The age, so yeah. That, so when I was five, yeah. When you were five. So I, I remember you telling myself a story uh, regarding you always being quite a competitive individual. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience when they did diagnose you? When they picked it up, yeah. yeah. So I, um, I was sitting in, in my, uh, I think I was in kindergarten at the time, um, so my first year of school, and I uh, there was a, a lady coming into the room and taking out other students in groups of sort of three or four, and then they'd come back, and um, I didn't know what the competition was, but I figured they were going away to do some sort of competition, and I was going to win the competition, and I didn't um, didn't realise that I was, I, was, I was a long way behind the eight ball for this particular competition. So uh, when I got called with a few other students, we went to into a, a like a, a small room um and there was some pictures on the back of the door um and so i was actually last so i heard all the other kids sort of say tree monkey house pig elephant all these you know these pictures so when it was my turn i said i'd already started learning to rope learn and memorize things so i um I, i said tree monkey house pig like in the same order the other kids have but um and by that point, it was sort of clear that this lady was testing our eyesight. She was, a, she was an eye nurse, um, a vision nurse, and she picked up that I was just wasn't even looking at the wall when I was saying the different pictures. And then she stood up and pointed to them in different direction, in different order, and I couldn't see uh, any of them. So that's sort of how they first picked it up. And uh, and then I went to the, the Sydney Eye Hospital and got extensive testing, and they yeah they they worked out that I had. Um, Stargarts or macular, macular dystrophy and um, yeah. So that was 30 years ago. That would have been incredibly daunting for a young child, I imagine. Your parents, how did they deal with that news? Yeah, so I don't remember it being particularly daunting for me because my parents, um, the way that my parents processed that, that was to um, basically shelter me from the fact that it was happening and, and didn't make out that it was a big deal. So I would imagine it would have been, and I know for a fact it was extremely challenging for them. Um, but for me, it wasn't really, you know, they didn't they didn't sort of say, oh, your life's going to be different now and you've got a disability and make a big deal out of it. They just sort of, they processed all the challenges themselves in the background and then they just let me live my five-year-old life, five-year-old child life. Um, and, yeah, there was a few little differences and we had to um, get enlarged print and all those things, even though I couldn't read the enlarged print, but that's, that's a very long story. But uh, I don't think I've told you that one before, but... Um, yeah, and then I didn't learn Braille because I didn't think it was cool. Um, and I went through a mainstream yeah. school, and they didn't have um, the, they didn't have supports in mainstream schools. I mean, I think I was you know there wasn't many kids back in those in the eighties that went through main, with disabilities that went through mainstream schools. So um, that was a challenge, and that was a fight my parents had to have with the school to keep me in the school. Um, but then, then the school didn't have the support net, the support um, and the training they needed to be able to to support me in the way that I needed. But I, I mean, I learned in different ways i had an education of listening and asking questions and that set me up for success in my first career which is in you know really large multi-million dollar corporate sales yeah and look you went from there into obviously competitive sports as well i imagine your parents uh well it, it's one of the most common things that we say that we let your child guide guide you on some of your parenting decisions but then you went into what rugby union that must have been uh, that must have been very interesting being a parent in that situation and going okay well yeah that's that's where we're going now. Well, I think it's that actually stems so the way that started. I played rugby league first, and I played rugby union. Um, yeah. 
So my first ever my first ever representative jersey. I've worn lots of different representative jerseys at this point in my life, but my first ever rep jersey was for the Manly Seagulls when I was uh, when I was nine. And um, the way us my league start career started was Dad um, was having a beer with a few mates, and they said they said, "Oh, does Matt have any mates that want to play at footy?" Because there were a few short in the, and this was when I was so I just when I was five, and I said they were just going through the whole change of me losing my vision. Yeah. Um, and the and Dad said, "Oh, well, Maddie will play." And these the two guys I was having a beer with basically made him out to be the bad person. Um, and this is one of the stories I tell when I do motivational speaking, and it's just a perspective point. So they made out to him to be the bad person because he was wanting to put his child with a disability in harm's way. Right. Whereas the perspective my dad had was he was trying to give his his child an opportunity to play sport and to be part of the community. So, and oh, that's the way I look at it. And so he, my parents always said, well, let's just try things. And I played rugby, rugby league. I played rugby union. I played ice hockey, all to a representative level um, in able-bodied sport, not in para sport. Um, and that was all started by let's just give it a crack and, and see how you go. And if you can't do it, we'll work out a different way. But, um, through training and you know through different different ways of, of managing the field and the ice, I was able to be very successful in those sports. But you know, I, I knew, knew I I had to manage all that, that all that around my disability, and and I, I I focused on roles on the field and on the ice that allowed me to to manage um, the way I played because of my sight. Which makes perfect sense. Um, did you? So you obviously have earned a couple of different representative jerseys growing up yeah uh, allowed you to travel with sport i imagine as well yeah did it give yep. you a first so, taste of traveling yeah my first my first rep team that i traveled with was to fiji um it was with the ringer rats for rugby union um and we played we did a tour all the way around fiji um and we won a lot we were a really good team we won a lot of games um until we played their um their national team in Suva, um, and when we arrived, they were bulldozing the field. So at the time, that they, they, they didn't have grass on the field, and they were bulldozing. I said, "Why are you bulldozing?" We said, "Why are you bulldozing the field?" And they were bulldozing because there was rocks and stuff. So it basically pushed all the rocks back into the into the um, pitch. Um, and they 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 ran out their national team, and I was un, I think I was under sixteen, so under fifteen, and they um, the most of them didn't have boots on. So that's their national team, and they, and they so they and they just ran rings around us. They were so fast we couldn't. Uh, couldn't, our, back, our backs couldn't get our hands on them and their, their forwards were really dominant as well. But, uh, yeah, no, that was it was a good tour. Uh, but the, the biggest uh, the biggest change for me there was when we played the regional teams, not the national team, but the, the teams around the island. We'd play in, um, in tribal communities and a lot of the times there was palm trees and stuff in the middle of the pitch and a couple of times I ran straight into the palm trees because they didn't move. So for my vision and people that have got a little bit of vision will know that if things move, they, you can pick them up. So I've got sort of Tyrannosaurus Rex vision, T-Rex vision. If something moves, I can see it. If it stands still, it's pretty safe. And those palm trees were safe um, from everywhere else except for me because I kept running into them. Wow. I got a few cuts on my face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so you went – did you go all the way to Wallabies? No, no, I didn't. So when I was – when I was, I had another challenge in my life. When I was, to, when I was 16 – I got glandular fever, yeah, um, and a really bad dose of it. I was bedridden for six weeks, um, and the, when I finished, when I came good, the doctors uh, said that if I played footy, so at the end of time I was playing rugby union and ice hockey. Yeah. They said if I played if I played union or ice hockey that year, and I got a I got a, a good tackle to the spleen or or a, or a stick to the spleen, my spleen would probably rupture because it was so enlarged because of the glandular fever, yeah. and I'd probably die of septicemia. So I missed the whole season at that age. And for me, I had to be fitter than everyone else. I used to do basically a triathlon before school every day. I'd do, I'd do a run, swim, ride. You know, I'd do sometimes between 200 and 300 push-ups before school as a 15-year-old yeah. um, just so I could be fitter than the other kids because I had to make up for my, my lack of vision, um, fitter and stronger. So missing a season meant I wasn't as fit. I wasn't doing all that training. I wasn't training with the boys in, at, at ice hockey and at, fo- at footy. Um, and also I lost all those... Um, skills that I was using to for my using my hearing um to manage the field so then I, I went back for 17s and um I just I just went from being one of the better players in the field and, and the team captain for my school to being feeling like I was a um 
uh, I was more of a hindrance than a than a than a contributor. So that was that ended my career basically. In I still played a few football games and I played Oztag, but um, that def that stopped my representative level um, sport and in, in in enabled bodied sport. So you went from there into cycling. You obviously spoke about yeah. the fact that you did cycling before school. I'd love yeah. to know who came up with that workout regime, whether that was you or somebody else, because that's intense. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was me. It was, <laughs> it was you. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying my hardest there. Yeah. 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 There, no, cool. there was absolutely no strategy involved. It was just a young kid just knowing I had to be fitter and faster than everyone else. Yeah. So cycling, what made you get into cycling? Is it is it accident? I felt once well, same as footy. I sort of fell into it. I um, I was on the bus going to work one day, and the guy that was going to work that I worked with, he was he worked in one of our product teams. Um, said he was good, he'd always wanted to ride to Melbourne. He was about to take leave and ride from Sydney to Melbourne. Um, and I didn't even own a bike at the time. Literally didn't own a bike. I was living in an apartment in D1. I didn't have a bike because I was I was that close to the beach. I could just walk down to, to surf. Um, and he um. I said, I'll come with you. And he's like, because he, all he'd imagine is this guy at work that walks around with a cane most of the time and has a huge monitor um, and listens to, and he has his phone talking to him the whole time. Um, so he, um, he was like, I oh, backpedaled pretty quickly. Like, no, 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 I wasn't really, haven't really made a decision yet. I'm not sure. Um, but the way I operate, if I decided to do something, I'd sort of get it, work it out and get it done pretty quickly. So by 10 o'clock that morning, I'd done a bit of research on, I didn't even know how far people rode in a day. I was like, what, how, do, how far do you, can you ride in a day? So I did a bit of Googling on that, and worked out that 120 kilometres was pretty reasonable. Um, so then I worked out all the towns to get to Melbourne, how, like what was the gaps for every 120 kilometres, and then set him a spreadsheet with a map by 10 o'clock saying, this is the route we're going to take from Sydney to Melbourne and we should do it for charity. And um, yeah, we went from there and we did the ride. We did it for the Macular Generation Foundation because um, the... Um, Fun fact, uh, fun visual impairment fact, the architect that designed the Opera House, Sydney Opera House, um, uh, developed macular degeneration in his old age. Um, so we started from there as a point and we finished in, uh, in Melbourne. So I did that and through that process, met a few different people in cycling and I could ride really fast up the hills because, you know, it's like if you're visually impaired, walking up hill, walking, walking upstairs is pretty safe and you can go pretty fast because if you fall forwards, you just fall on your hands it's not that far whereas if you're walking downstairs it's up you fall a long way um and the same with cycling when you're riding up a hill if you if you get a bit out of control you can put the brakes on and you stop straight away whereas if you're riding down a hill um you put the brakes on and you get airborne so um, i'd ride really fast up hills and then really slow down hills um that was on a single bike not on a tandem and so i got noticed as being quite powerful and um after i'd done the, the, did the ride to melbourne i was approached by one of the head coaches from cycling australia and we had a bit of a meeting at the time I was lifting a lot of weights. So I was 94 kilos, like a really, really big muscly guy. Um, and he's like, you're going to have to get rid of all that muscle and um, strip down because you're powerful, but the power to weight and cycling is more important. So you've got to get leaner. So, so that after that, I said that during that meeting, I want to become a world champion and a Paralympic champion. And he said, he sort of laughed at me and I said, no, that's what I want to do. Um, and that was in 2010. And then by 2011, I was riding for, riding for Australia. I rode, rode my first world uh, championships in Denmark. So, so that's, that's how that all started. How did you, uh, you know, well, I mean, obviously hard work's going to come into the discussion, but how did you lose yeah. the weight? What was, what was your fitness regime like? Uh, yeah, hard work it's a, and focus on the goal. So um, hang on, I'm just going to, my kids are just talking. I'm just going to close the door. Give me two seconds. <laughs> Guys, can you go downstairs, please? Um, so I, to get rid of that weight, cause I wasn't, I wasn't, um, it wasn't adipose tissue. I wasn't fat. I was just big muscly. So I had to get rid of the muscle, which is even harder than getting rid of, um, adipose tissue. So I basically rode, I let my body eat itself. So I didn't eat, um, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but it was what I needed to do to get done what I needed to do as quickly as I did. Um, so I would train at about four o'clock every morning. I'd jump on my trainer, um, and, um, I wrote, when I first started just to get fit enough and then I started racing on a tandem with, with a guy um, and then yeah but within the, sort of about nine months of starting that process uh, I was riding um, a lot of kilometers so yeah once I was at that once I was the top right I was sort of once I became the top guy in the world I was riding about 100 kilometers every morning um, and then I would do and this is every day six days a week 
Then I would do gym um, and I'd drop down to 73 kilos. So I went from 94 kilos down to 73 kilos. Um, and then I so I'd do, yeah, 100 Ks ish every, every morning, six days a week. And I'd do gym three or four days a week at lunchtime. And then three or four days a week, I'd also do a, a spin, like an ergo session on a stationary bike in my garage at night for about an hour. Um, and then I'll, but my, and my food to, whilst I was outputting all those, burning all those calories, I would only have after my 100k ride, I would have, I would have no food before I rode the bike. So I'd go out empty stomach and then I'd have a protein shake, which would be with water, not with milk because there's calories in the milk and the sugar in the milk. So I'd have a protein shake with just water. And then at lunchtime would be the only time I'd have carbohydrates. So I'd have um, like a, usually like a rice dish. So maybe like a, a, um, a pad thai or some just stir fried rice or something like that. And then for dinner, I'd have veg- just literally have um, vegetables and a piece of meat, just enough protein to not get sick and enough vitamins to not get sick. And that was it. So it was, um, I was hungry every night. I went to bed hungry. I, I would, um, it would ha- be hard to get to sleep every night because I was so hungry every night. But And you know, years I, and I, years of maintaining that, I imagine, as well. Uh, yeah. That's, it was uh, a lot of discipline. It's, it's would you say would you agree with me in saying that cycling isn't something you do for 30 years of your life or something like that with uh with no that sort of regimen? at that level not at that level i mean you can ride for 30 years easily but at that level no and, and you need to do that um i mean the guys that ride the tour de france they're the same you need to you need to run that lean because you um it's it's the power uh, power versus weight ratio is, is is what it's all about so yeah, it was absolute burnout. And by the time I got to Rio, I was done. I didn't want to ride anymore. But, you know, there's a lot of guys that do it and don't like get to that level. And the reason they don't get to that level is because they haven't got the discipline. And the top guys don't not, don't last that long because it's not sustainable to live your life in that way. I mean, I was yeah, sleeping in a, in a um, tent with reduced oxygen, so an altitude tent, um, which in the middle of summer in Australia is so hot, like you'd just be sweating in there. Yeah. Um, but that would, that would obviously increase my red blood cell count. There was a bunch of stuff that we were doing that was so uncomfortable. But you know what? I did that and I was world record holder. Whereas if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have won a gold medal. Yeah, you don't do half measures, do you? <laughs> no. Noticing the trend there. So obviously yeah. making it to a, to a Paralympics, huge, huge dream in any sport. What's something that you can tell us as, as an athlete that you experienced that us as watchers wouldn't know even existed? Um, look, it's, I think at the Paralympics itself, the world championships is, is amazing. And to where you, 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 the the green and gold is just such a special time. Um, and then to when you, when you first ever international events, my first ever international event was a world cup in Canada and to stand on that podium and to hear your national anthem play is just a, that's for me, that's the time, you know what I mean? When the times when you get to stand on the podium and, and have your national anthem played is, um, is really special. Um, but when you go to the Paralympics, it's not, it's all the other sports because you don't ever get to see those sports just at a world championships because you go to world championships for cycling. It's a bunch of cyclists like Tyrannosaurus Rex is walking around with big chunky legs and little skinny arms. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then you go to surfing world championships and there's pretty fit people, but they're like pretty well balanced fit people that are all cruisy you know, and, and normal average height. They're sort of average frame people. And then you, and then you go to the Paralympics and there's all these huge volleyball players that are like seven feet tall and there's people in wheelchairs like, fl- like flying around everywhere. they got the whole, like the wheelchair rugby team just literally flying at you. Um, and it, yeah, I think it's that mix of all the different sports and the different body shapes from all those different sports. Um, is uh, Yeah, that's, that's the one thing for me. There's a memory where you, um, yeah, wearing, wearing the green and gold is such an honour, but yeah, the, the different sports is such an eye-opener because you just don't get to see them normally. And it was, would you consider that a take stock moment or did you, were you full on in competitive mode, right? My next race is this time I need to be prepared or did you kind of wander around like a tourist a little bit around the Olympic village? Well, I, I don't want to put a downer on it, but Rio was pretty bad. Um, we couldn't use the, like we didn't, there was no, the, the public toilets you couldn't use, there was poo everywhere it was really bad like there was not you didn't walk around it wasn't exciting the food was pretty bad it smelled everywhere the we had a beautiful condo that if you looked at it on a photo you'd just be like this is a i'd love to go there but in reality it was a body of water that had no filtration and they just put a bit more chlorine in it every night and guys would come around with with nets so we none of us could swim in the water we couldn't leave the village because it was in rio and 
um, like a lady had her finger cut off the day we got there because they they couldn't. She was pregnant, and, and the people that were trying to rob her couldn't get her wedding ring off her finger. So they because her fingers were sawn, so they cut her finger off. Um, it was it was definitely wasn't the best place to go for a um, for an Olympics. So I'll definitely be keen to uh, to go again for um, for for LA when it's you know hopefully a bit better. Yeah, so let's, okay. uh, well, that's that's a good place to leave that and go on to surfing, yeah. obviously. Uh, yeah. Now, transitioning from cycling to surfing, yeah. did you, was it like a conscious transition? Did you go, right, okay, well, I want to surf now or had you been surfing for a while? So we, um, so we talked before about the burnout. The, the, and yeah, yeah. It wasn't the burnout from training. It was the burnout from everything, from not being able to go to the service station and get a protein bar. You know, can't have it. You can't, can't go to the cafe and get a smoothie because what if someone used powders in the smoothie that have banned substances in them? Yeah. So every part of your day is just so full on with like, what if, what if, what if, manage, 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 get to bed on time, sleep in a tent you know, not, don't always hungry, all that stuff. It's just, it's not sustainable for a long period. So I did it for 10 years and that was enough. But I was always throughout the last couple of years before I retired saying, I can't wait to go back to surfing because surfing was always, always my love. Um, so growing up in Narrabeen, that's all I did was surf. Um, if it was good waves, otherwise we played in the lake. I was always in the water. And my mates used to say when we were surfing, um, imagine if they let you, you blind, um, and I won't use the word they use, but it was an expletive. Um, compete against each other you'd be you'd, you'd beat everyone and I used to always laugh and go no, it's not never going to happen it's too dangerous they'll we'll run into each other and I'll never have blind surfing um, and then I, I was actually in Italy doing my base camp training for um, for Rio and um, my mate texts me and he's like you wouldn't believe it they're going to let you blind expletives compete against each other in surfing and there was this press release that they were having the first ever world championships for para surfing in 2016 so I was I was just going to go surfing, just free surfing, not competitive or anything. Just, I just wanted to go surfing and that was my sport. And I was going to retire from competition. I wasn't going to be a, a, a competitive athlete anymore. And then, yeah, they made they made surfing a, a competitive para sport. So um, I went to, look, I rang my, I rang Surfing Australia and said, look, any chance I can get on the team for next year? I wasn't even thinking about it for 2016 because I just got back from Rio in, in, in September. So I called them early October. And they said, um, if you come up next week, we're doing a selection camp, like a competition on the Gold Coast. And I said, oh, I probably can't do that. Well, I've just told my wife I'm retiring. And like, I've been away for three months at the at, at Rio and training in Italy and in Spain. And um, let me, so I rang my wife and to her credit, she said, look, go up there. We'll go up as a family holiday to the Gold Coast. Why not? And, um, and if you go... If you go any good, then you, you might go to world championships, but you're probably not going to go any good because you haven't been surfing that much, so you probably won't win, so we'll just go for a holiday. Um, anyway, I went to that camp in October and I won that comp, and then I went and competed for Australia that year and, and at the world championships, and I came third, um, and then I've won everything else ever since except for world championships at uh, last year in Pismo. So that was my worst ever result. I came fourth, so I'm very hungry this year to come back and, um, and take my title back. So leading into your first world title um, yeah. that you did win, yeah. did you ever have sort of doubts about the change at all or anything like that? Or was it just one of those things where you just once again fell into it and then went 100 mile an hour? Um, what changed? Changed from surfing to cycling to surfing? Yeah. Well, it wasn't really a change because I was going back to what I love. I was going back to surfing. So for me, it wasn't really a big change. It was more about just doing it competitively. And then because I'd come third and I hadn't really been surfing, I was like, well, I've definitely going to have a good shot if shot, I actually yeah. train. Yeah. So I trained and, yeah, I was, I've been really, really dominant, but the, the categories are getting a lot better. Um, Jack Jackson from Australia, he's another competitor. He's, he's coming up really good. There's a few other bit competitors around the world. So I, I was, I, without being too arrogant, I was pretty comfortable for me to win from 2017 through to 2020. Um, I wasn't really pushed. Um, but now they're really starting to push me, and it's um, it's re- it's a real strong co- competitive um, competition in our category now. Which should only make your hunger stronger, knowing you. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're at the halfway point of the webinar, so I just want to remind people that if you do have questions for Matt, shoot them in the chat function. If you do use a screen reader, you can use the keystroke Alt H and type your question in. 
I'm sure Matt would love to get any of your questions through. Uh, we do have a question at this particular point that was submitted prior to today's uh, session by Lorraine asking, what would you consider being visually impaired? What are your strengths compared to other visually impaired people? Compared to other visually impaired people? Yeah. Oh. It's a challenge, isn't I it? Don't, I, I don't know that I have any. Um, I'm... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe I was very lucky growing up. I, I think I know some people that we talked earlier around my parents sheltering me from the um, the process of me having a disability and, and not maybe making it a big deal that I had I was different to everybody else. Um, that and that's not my strength. That's my parents' strength. But maybe that's a strength that's helped me in my life is that they. They didn't make everything. They didn't sort of say you can't do these things. You're, you've got a disability. You're different. They just said you, 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 you can do anything you like. Try as hard as you can, and if you try, then you'll probably be able to do it. And you know, most of the time, I did. So that's probably you know something that's helped me. I wouldn't say it's my strength because it's definitely not something I did. It was my parents did that for me. But that's you know that, I'd say that's probably a strength over other people, um, the other people with visual impairment that maybe didn't have that same. Um, we'll rephrase the same question as well. What's what would you say would be your biggest strength in beating the up up and coming surfers coming through next year? Mate, I'm older than them. I've got a lot more experience in the water, um, so that's my biggest strength at the moment. I've got a lot more experience. I've got well over ten thousand hours in the water, and um, and I'm also got a lot of experience um, in competition. So my 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 Paralympic and you know professional competition in um from cycling um really gives me uh, a big edge i don't get nervous I'm, i've got a 20 or a 40 minute heat in surfing and i can just get the job done um in cycling the, the gate the, the, that goes beep 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 yeah beep beep and then you got to go and if you if you're not ready too bad you lose yeah. So, I mean, if you talk about pressure, that's one of the most high pressure environments you could ever be in because you've got to literally get it right on that within that second. Otherwise, you, um, yeah, game over. So, that's, that's probably my two, my just experience in general is definitely my biggest strength over some of the other competitors. So, for somebody who's blind or low vision getting into the water for the first time, yeah. Um, what, what would you say would be the most important thing for them? Just, just go hard. It's not. It's. Uh, or, or, so not get, don't get too hard. Go out when it's small and it's. It's not too big because I think if you get scared, then you won't want to do it. But just get as many waves as you can. The more waves you catch, the more experience you'll get. The the better you'll get, um, and the more Maybe comfortable you'll get. School or something as well. Yeah, go to go to a school. I mean, through NDIS as well, you can probably find people if you do live near a beach. You can probably find people that will take you. Surfing, and I think getting that one-on-one -on -one support is really helpful. Um, and if there's a board riders club in your area, um, maybe reach out to your bo local board riders club and, and let them know that you're visually impaired and you'd love to go surfing. And if they could, they could recommend someone because anyone that's part of a board riders club is going to be going to be a a really good surfer, but b probably a pretty good person because they're part of a club and they're giving back to their community. So that would be my my big tip. Cool. Uh, I've got a question from Oscar asking what your favourite beach to surf on the Gold Coast is well depends on the day but you can't go past snapper i think snapper and green mount when it's when it's big and there's not many people out you can't go past it um but then if it's really crowded and, and there's there's some good banks out at um Chugan, um or blinger I'll, I'll go there along those beaches where there's less people because yeah the super bank gets crazy crazy crowded and becomes unfun so you you now classify yourself as a is a big wave surfer don't you i uh, don't know if i classify myself as that i do like surfing big waves though yeah so what what would be the main differences between give us an example what is a big wave um to me a big wave is a wave probably that's over 20 feet 20 to 30 feet yeah so what is what are some of the differences other than the amount of damage you could do if it came crashing down on you <laughs> um well the the main difference is, is the way you surf the wave um i mean i'm surfing if i'm surfing a six foot wave i'm probably going pretty crazy like doing vertical turns and pulling, pulling into the barrel on a 20 to 30 foot face i'm not pulling into the barrel oh, I, I would if it's a perfect wave but most of the time i'm just 
going across the wave and, and staying alive. But also the biggest one of the biggest differences is equipment. You don't um, you don't ride you ride different boards for different um, size waves. So I, I ride shorter boards with wider tails for small waves because they glide and they turn sharper. Um, whereas on bigger waves, I ride narrower boards with pulled in tails because it's more control when you push on the tail because you've got you want instead of trying to increase speed, you actually got to control the speed. So the boards are shaped very differently for different types of waves. And then for those type, those bigger waves as well, I don't paddle into those waves. I've got, uh, I'm getting whipped in by a jet ski. So jump either jumping off the side of the jet ski or on a tow rope and then pulling myself into the wave off the rope. So how do you know when the wave is turning? Uh, do you, do you get sort of instructions or can you feel it? I can feel it because I've been surfing for that long. I can feel what the wave's doing most of the time. Uh, but when I'm when I'm surfing the really big waves, I've got my jet ski driver that tows me into the wave or steps me off, and they'll ride. They'll normally ride along near me, like just behind the pocket of the wave, so just in front of the wave as it's breaking, and they can yell out, race it, or pull in, which is pull into the barrel, um, or do a cutback. So they'll they'll talk me through the wave as well because they can see it. Okay. So a few different ways, but yeah, in, in a competition environment, it's just down to the my comp, my spotter who's the person in the water. Um, so they're my right, they're my right hand man or woman in the water, telling me what wave to catch. They get me onto the wave, so they talk me into the wave, and then once I'm on the wave, it's up to me to to surf the wave as best I can. Okay. So you also do a high level job in your spare time. I, I put the I put quotations on spare time. Mm. Uh, so you work for Optus. What sort of led you into this employment, and what sort of oh, advice would you have for others seeking full time employment in the corporate sector? I started off, my, I ran a business um, doing personal training and massage therapy when I was in my early 20s. Um, so my background's in health science. And I basically realized that if I lost a hand or if I um, got seriously physically injured and the amount of extreme sports I played, that was something that I thought was pretty highly likely. Um, I decided to go and get a job working for a corporate that could be a backup for me so I, I expected to go back to personal training and massage and, and run another business I didn't expect to do it full time uh, but I got a, a job I looked around for a job that I could do because I mean as a visually impaired person you can't drive taxis you probably can't work at a checkout there's not a lot of transactional work that you can do um, so I figured and that's you know sometimes that's the fallback for people if they lose their job um, so I went and got a job and my job ended up being with Optus um, so I started there as a manager in a call center and I've worked my way out through the company. So I've been there nearly 20 years um, and I've worked in all, multiple roles. I worked in government operations. I worked in, um, I was a business analyst. I've been a, a sales leader. I run, I think I alluded to earlier, I used to have multi-million dollar sales target as an account executive. Um, and then over the last, you know, so the last six years I've been, um, head of sustainability so I'm the sustainability executive um, and that was a, that was a change for me from sales because I wanted to do something that gives back to the business but also gives back to the community so I've chased that now in my career and that'll be my focus I think you know moving forward is about giving back but also um, creating that governance for large corporates to be able to to give back in a way that helps the community but also helps the business so we're starting out at Optus um... 20 odd years ago there must have been some yeah. changes you've seen in the workplace um workplace sort of approaching disability in general did yeah. you have any did you have any challenges along the way that that sort of meant that you can't couldn't do certain things or were told you couldn't do certain things or is that something that you just kind of overcame like you have done many other things yeah look i think there was definitely a number of hurdles along the way and there's a number of comments that people have made along the way um I just sort of ignore those a lot of the time. I'm actually one of my other roles in so my spare time. One of my other hats I wear at Optus is I'm the chair of the disability network um, and diversity. So I, I've had a lot of exposure to what other people's journey looks like as well through that. And um, yeah, look, there is, there's still a lot of challenges and um, we've, we've got some big goals around supporting people with disabilities, both in our workforce, but also as a, in our customer base. Um, but we're, we're definitely not, market leading at the moment um so um it's a big journey and a lot of businesses are on it i speak to a lot of executives in, in large corporates in the banks and 
other organisations and everyone's got a lot of aspirations at the moment, but there's so many challenges. Um, I mean, you make any system changes in a large organisation, it costs millions of dollars. So to create accessibility, when you haven't included that as part of your original build, um, there's a lot of, it's a lot of cost and a lot of work. So um, yeah, look, there's a, it's a journey. And um, the, the biggest thing for me is that it, it is more it's topical at the moment. It's more about, it's more on the agenda. There's a lot of people talking about it. A lot of companies, it's important for them to talk about it and to be seen to be doing something. And, and I think for me, even if, I think it's better that people are doing it for the right reasons and they're doing it because they actually want to create good. But I think even for some of the companies that aren't doing it for the reasons, they're just doing it because they want to, their logo to be seen as um, helping people with disabilities. It's all actually helping us go in the right direction because it's all exposure um, and it all creates awareness for people in the community. Yeah, cool. Uh, I've got a question here from, from Chris. Uh, hi, Matt. So interested in your story. Did not count, catch how much vision you have and the determined you must have to have so much confidence. I have 10%, 10 vision in one eye due to a plot, uh, blood clot okay. uh, and I have no family. So getting over the shock is a huge mountain. So can you describe your, your vision and, and how yeah. you gain that confidence? So I, I have um, no central vision and I have about 5% peripheral vision. Um, so I've got fields, but I've got, I can sort of see shapes and lines. So all my, uh, accessibility tools is voiceover. Um, I, I think I, you know, I gained my confidence when I was a child and that was, I think very, for me, that was a, um, it was great to be able to explore the world with a disability as a child. I, I can imagine it would be a lot more difficult to acquire a disability as an adult, um, so I built confidence through doing things. That's how I built confidence. And um, I think failing is a really important part, pro part of the process in becoming um, good at anything or, or being successful or being comfortable. So I'm very comfortable with failure. Um, car failure to me is, is an opportunity to learn. Failing at the same thing multiple times is probably not something that I'm super comfortable with. But when you when you do when you make it when you fall over you trip over you make mistakes, things break, you can learn from those experiences and then you can move forward. So um, I would say my biggest um, advice to anyone that's trying to do something and wants to build confidence is just do things, just do as many things as you can. And guess what? If you're not that good at them to start with, if you decide you really want to do it and you have a passion for it, the more you do it, the better you'll get. Yeah. Cool. Um, another question we've got from Namoy regarding goal setting seems to be something yeah. you've mastered. Can you walk us through how you structure your goals? Um, so with goal setting, I do this in business and in sport. If I have a goal that I want to get to, I look at, I, I set a really high goal. So, so what I look, might look at my goal and then say, actually, what's a bigger goal than that? Because that goal might be a bit boring. Um, so I, I find a really stretched goal that's quite big. So with my cycling, for example, it was like, what's the biggest you can do? And that was world champion, Paralympian. Um, and I didn't have world record holder as a goal, but, you know, that, that ended up being part of my process as well. But um, what I then did was, okay, how long will it take me to get there? So what does it, what, what does, what's the best in the world? Who's done it the quickest in the world? Who's gone from being not owning a bike? To becoming a world champion and how, how long did that take them and you know i might have found out online through research that took 10 years so i'll say well i'll set myself a goal of doing it in, in three years um because I, I think you know if you do the right processes you can get things done quicker and if you take learnings from other people i talked a moment ago about making mistakes there's another way you can learn and that's through other people's mistakes so if you learn that other people have done things um and it's a lot harder it's you know that old shoulders on a, a young head on old shoulders or whatever the, the term is but um it's for me as i'm a bit older it's a lot easier for me to take other people's learnings when i was younger i, I couldn't be told anything i had to learn it myself um but so you get that goal how long is it going to take to get there then you need to work out the stepping stones moving back so what's the step before then so the step before becoming a world champion is you need to actually ride for your country so how do you then so when can i do that by and then how and then maybe you ride for your country but then you then you want to get in the top 50 in the world and then the top 20 in the world so you have all those stepping stones so you work backwards on that and you work out the and you have and the most important part of this whole process is dates i can't stress that enough there needs to be dates in built into your plan 
but, and you have to hit those dates. And if you don't hit those dates, you need to readjust your whole plan. So you work backwards from that until you get down to, okay, I don't own a bike. I need to buy a bike. What's the best bike for me to own with the budget I have at the moment? And then what riding do I do? So your plan isn't just to get to your first step. Your plan is actually to get all the way to being the best in the world. And then you adjust and then you, but you, but it's broken down granularly enough that you know what tomorrow looks like to do, to actually do your first ride. So uh, we've got another question from Namoy, just in regards to how you've encountered and dealt with ableism in the past. Okay. Uh, how would you, how have you managed that in the past? I would say you sort of touched on ignoring it and just kind of doing your own thing. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I'm not aware. Of, I'm not familiar with the term. So that's, yeah. No, it's been described as uh, someone being discriminatory to people who okay. have disabilities. Okay. Um, okay. I need, to, I need to bring myself up to speed with that term. Um, I think that discrimination is a part of life and it comes from insecurity. And I, I grew up with a lot of insecurities. And I mean, I spoke earlier about my goal earlier on in my life being to prove to the world I didn't have a disability. That's a huge insecurity. Um, and I think as I grew up and built confidence in myself, I realised that um, people, are, people that discriminate against other people do it because um, of the ignorance um, and they're not doing it on purpose. They're just doing it because they're not aware that they're doing it or they're doing it uh, on purpose because they're a bully or because they're having insecurities in, within themselves. So I think when you come at it from that perspective um, and you see people having those behaviours, you can call it out, but you can also feel sorry for them because... Um, they've obviously got issues within their life. Um, so, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm very privileged. I'm in, a, I'm in a position in my life where I'm quite senior in my business and I can not just call people out, but I can, I can adjust behaviours very quick, easily. Um, and also as an as a, as a athlete, I'm quite respected in the community. And if I, if I say something, people generally take notice. So, I mean, I don't want to um, devalue the fact that that's that's the position i'm in i mean i'm in a very privileged position um so it would definitely be more tricky for people that aren't in that position to manage that um but i, I really feel like it's about education at all at all points of the, of the process it's education for those people that are being discriminatory helping them understand but also educating the community that that's happening and if you if people are having those behaviors i, I would be calling them out so going back to your goal setting and yeah. the fact that you have multiple hats that you're wearing at any given time on any given day. Yes. I also mindful the fact that as you touched on, you're a husband and a father of two as well. I know from three. Having kids myself, three, sorry, my yeah. apologies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot one. Um, yeah. I, I have several as well. And they, yes. have a, uh, they have a habit of throwing your plans completely out the window on any given yes. day. How do yeah, you well, they've been walking in another room while I've been doing this the whole time. Yeah, I saw um, them dancing. <laughs> yeah, are they dancing? Are they great? Okay. Um, I yeah, look, I manage my my hats, and this is not a good example of this, but well, I normally wear one hat at a time. So I don't. I try as much as I can to wear one hat and do that hat really well, and then I put the other hat on and do that really well. So I'll, I'll be an athlete in the morning and train. Then I'll be a dad and make kids spend all my time with my kids and make them breakfast and take them to school. And don't pick up my phone. I don't. I don't answer calls unless it's from you obviously um but I, I i i wear my hats very separately and then i'm a i work for optus i'm on a few different boards when i'm in when i'm working for that that company i wear i wear that hat um and i think by doing that you can separate everything and give everyone the focus they need if you try and wear multiple hats you're not going to get anything done well um you're going to get really confused and people that you're dealing with are going to feel like you're not focused on them and you're not and you're distracted so that's how I manage it um, as best I can. Obviously, today's not a good example. My wife's at work and I've got a, um, and there's a uh, student free day. So I've got my kids here at home with me um, and I've got Quite to go and get on a well. flight. <laughs> I'm, to, I'm getting picked up by my taxi in half an hour. I've got to pack a bag and have a shower before I go. So, yeah. So that's, it's a all, good segue. It's all a <laughs> that's a good segue for me uh, at this particular point in time to remind people. So we've got five minutes left of the webinar. If you have any last minute questions, you got a thank you from Chris um, from Eight Mile Thanks, Plains. Chris. Gratitude to yourself, sharing your story and giving your time. Uh, I will also mirror that because I know how busy you are. <laughs> uh, the question I want to sort of start, well, I want to sort of end with, if we don't have any other questions, is going to be 
2022, obviously half the year is done. What does 2022 end like for you? What have you got coming up? I'm making a movie at the moment about my life, a documentary. Um, so we're finishing filming the movie. And have they got um, so that'll take lined up to play yet, or no, no, this is this is a documentary. So that that there's another movie that's in the works as well, but we'll um we'll see how that one goes. But um, <laughs> no, it was we, we've sort of done a third of the filming now. We've got another two thirds to do, and the, the main the main scenes is around big wave surfing. So um, I'll be surfing some pretty big waves in the next month or two. Um, um we're looking at surfing Shipstones Bluff as well, which is a never been surfed before by anyone with a disability um let alone a blind person so it's a very heavy wave for anyone that doesn't know about it it's one of the most dangerous waves in the world um and yeah so we're doing that and i've got a whole bunch of work that i need to do for optus um i'd love to spend a bit of time with my kids and my wife and finish off the i coach my son's footy team as well when i'm another another one of my hats so can't wait to see their, their, them finish the season off they've done really well they're basically undefeated this season and um yeah, just as he's just wearing all my hats and adding as much value as I can in all the different parts of my life. So this is probably not the uh, the best question to end on, but you can be incredible at absolutely everything and still find it difficult to be happy. I'm going to probably go with emotional resilience. How do you sort of manage that? So you're obviously, uh, I, I heard like a rather interesting question thrown at Lane Beachley recently. I'm not sure if you're yep. familiar with her sort of stuff. But um, me and Lane are working together tomorrow on an event, yep. There you go. So she was yep. pointing out that she was winning everything, but it became yep. all about the winning and she struggled yep. with the emotional side of things. How do you find with that? How do you manage that? I only do things that bring me joy. So when I was younger, yeah, I had I did do some <laughs> things like that. But now, and, and that included sales and I chased money and all that stuff and it wasn't really. But these days I just do things that give me happiness. If something doesn't give me happiness, I'm about to step down from one of the boards I'm on because I'm not enjoying it. Um, so, yeah, and if things aren't giving me joy in my life and they're not adding value to my family and giving my, ha- my family happiness, um, I don't do it. So that's how I manage that. And it's as simple as that. And then I, I, I just make sure that I'm, I'm grateful every day. I'm grateful for... The, the my job i'm grateful for um my sport that i get to that i get to enjoy i'm grateful for my beautiful children and my wife um i think being grateful is, really helps you give have perspective as well um if you're not grateful and you're saying oh what the world hasn't done this for me and i haven't got this and someone should do this for me and you're being and you're being external and expecting other people to do things for you um, then you're probably not going to be happy and that's probably what lane was alluding to her external she was expecting the winning to be that external joy, um, she wasn't giving herself happiness. So, um, that, yeah, that's how I manage that. As I, uh, I make sure that what I'm doing is something that I enjoy. Turned out to be a very, very good way to end the webinar. Thank you. Can, can you I have done this point. before? Did, did, did you? <laughs> can I just say uh, that you, did, you said you could be good at everything, and I just want to touch on that point because it's, that's actually not a thing. I might be good at a couple of different things, and I'm really, I really focus hard on doing that, but. To be good at a couple of things, you have to exclude other things. You can't be good at everything. And I love playing guitar. I love playing didgeridoo, but I haven't picked up my guitar once this year. Um, it's it, If you want to be really good at things, you need to spend a lot of time in them. Um, and that requires dedication and focus, which means that some th- other things will get left behind. Great way to end it. Thank you so much for your time, mate. I know how busy you are. Um, no worries. I'm sure. Well, I'm, I'm hearing on the messenger that a lot of people are very happy with you're taking the time and hearing a bit about you. So uh, Matt Formson, thank you for your time. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate everyone else's time as well. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.